Praise the Lord. Let's clap our hands to the Lord again today. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. You are worthy, God. You are worthy. Amen. Amen. Good to see everyone this morning. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to be reading from verse 13 down through 19. Sunday we talked a little bit about this I'm probably going to talk a little bit more about it tonight amen but Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13 Jesus is coming into the coast of Caesarea Philippi a certain area a region in which he was teaching and preaching and he asked his disciples and he asked them he said who do men say that I the son of man am and they said, some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Who are you telling people that I am? Who do you believe that I am to be? And Simon Peter answered and he said, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You are the hope of Israel. You are the one that we've been waiting for. That's what he was telling him. And Jesus answered and he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And this is an important scripture right here. He says, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Amen. With the help of the Lord this morning, I want to preach on this thought, this message of continuing church culture. Continuing church culture culture. Let's put down our Bibles and let's pray again and ask the Lord to help us today. Brother Ryland, would you please pray? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Let's clap our hands to him again. And you are... Welcome to be seated. Amen. So I just want to throw this out there and kind of challenge our thinking a little bit today that when Jesus professed that he would build his church, now we understand and we know that the building is not the church. The building is the building. Um, there, there are all types of different buildings. There's old historical buildings that people have church in and there's new uh more modern buildings that people have church in there are uh different types there are some that doesn't even look like a church maybe it, on the outside at all but uh, of what we've defined that a church should look like but it, it looks very different but as long as there is that calling out that group of individuals in there worshiping jesus in spirit and in truth that is the church amen so Jesus, when he said he would build his church, he was not speaking about a building. We know that. In fact, when his disciples were, uh, take, were walking with him and they said, Lord, look at all these magnificent structures. Look at these uh, wonderful buildings. Look what the hands of man has created. And Jesus said, these are all going to be gone one day. In fact, God said when, um, when David was wanting to build a, a, a temple for the Lord, he said, you know, he, he realized, and even God said, you know, the heavens are my throne, the earth is my footstool. You cannot build something that can contain me. You cannot build a magnificent enough structure for, that would house me. You, you just can't do it. So we know he was not speaking of a building. And I, and I want to even challenge us today in our thinking of this and our understanding that maybe he wasn't even talking about the collection or the collecting together or the gathering of a group of people for a following. But I believe that what he was declaring was that he was going to build, he was going to create a culture for those who would be his people to example. 
and to spread throughout their world. I believe that he was building a mindset, an understanding, a, a, a culture of, of attitude and behavior on what God desires his people to be. Jesus said, I am going to build that, and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. Once we get it in our mind, once we get it in our heart, once it begins to ingrain us and make us into who God wants us to be, there is no devil in hell. There isn't anything that the enemy can do to stop that. He cannot prevail against what God is doing in our life. When we allow him, can you say amen? He was going to create a culture. And the definition of culture in this context is the attitudes and behavior characteristic of a particular social group. The attitudes and the behavior characteristic of a particular social group. There is culture everywhere. You can't get away from it. There is culture. It is everywhere, and it is different everywhere you go. There is culture in our world. In, all over the world, you can go, and you can see a culture of family. You can see where one man and one woman have come together and procreated and have children, and there is some type of family culture there all over the world. Amen? Amen. There is a culture of work all over our world. Well, people will go out and either go to a job or maybe it's in their own home. Maybe it's a, a farm or whatever it might be and they go to work and they go there and they do a specific task for a specific time for a specific pay. That's all around the world. There is a culture of work. There is a concept that you can go out and earn your living. Amen? Amen. It's all over our world. There is a structure and a culture of government all over our world. They're all different, but there is a government there. Some we agree with, some we disagree with. And so you find that wherever you go in our world. There is a culture in our nation. There is an American culture. It's based upon our constitution. We find in our constitution the things that we believe as, as American people, things that we believe that our forefathers have put together. Of course, uh, those things can always change, right? That culture changes. Culture can change. Absolutely it can. Uh, there is culture in our state of Wisconsin. Farms and cheese and beer. <laughs> In Wisconsin, those are things that you find in our culture that are staples that people uh, understand and know they are there historically. There's culture in our communities. Monroe and especially New Glarus has a very Swiss heritage about it. Uh, there is a growing diversity in our communities. And so we find that even in different smaller communities throughout our state, there is culture there. And most importantly... There is culture in our homes. Every home is different. The attitudes and behaviors in different homes are different. We were all raised differently. We all have been brought up with some different beliefs and different attitudes in our life. I want to really nail this down today, if I can, the importance of the culture in our homes. It is so important that we understand what the attitude and behavior is that is in our homes, what is being communicated, what is being learned, what is being picked up upon. Because it is so important, because culture is everywhere. You're going to get an attitude or a behavior from somewhere. Our children are going to learn from someone. They pick up from, home, from school. You ever have your kids start acting some way or saying a certain phrase or doing a certain thing and you're like, where did you get that from? Where on earth did you pick that up? Have you been hanging out with that so-and-so down the street again? You know, what was it in Leave it to Beaver, Eddie Haskell? You know, have you been hanging out with the Eddie Haskells of our neighborhood? Where did you get this attitude? Where did you get this behavior? That is not what we practice in our home. That is not what we believe. That is not something that we do. But we have to be careful because at some point we may have communicated that to some degree from our to our children. There is culture in our homes. And so it has got to be strong. It has got to be based upon the foundation of our beliefs in the word of God. Because again, our children will pick it up from somewhere. Behavior in homes is learned and it's imitated. Can you say amen? You ever hear anybody ever say, well, we never fight or argue in front of our kids. Maybe you said that before. 
And you may think that that's a good practice to never fight or argue in front of your kids. If you don't fight and argue in front of your kids and understand I'm talking about biblically, how will they ever learn to resolve conflict? If I, my wife and I have arguments sometimes in front of our kids. If she's going to start swinging, then I get the kids out of the room and I, no, I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm kidding. Too far, too far. Had to draw you back in. You're starting to get glassy-eyed already. Not even in my second page. No, but, but you've got to have some sort of idea on how to resolve conflict in your home. Kids have conflict in schools. They have conflict when, when they get into their jobs. There's conflict all around us, so they have to understand, how do we behave with that? How do I respond to that? How do I deal with those things? What's the right way? Because it's not the right way. Right? It's not. And so we have to understand, you know, that if we're going to do that, how do our kids learn these things biblically? The Bible says be angry and sin not. It doesn't say don't be angry. Anger is an emotion. You can get angry, but we have to be exampling these things to our kids. It is so important in the home. Listen to this. Culture is learned. Everybody say culture is learned. It is not innate. It is not something that you are born with, that that's just everything that you are is your culture. It is shared. It is not individual. It is behavior. It is held in common by a group of people, empowering them with a way of life. Culture is learned behavior that is passed on by imitation, instruction, and example. I'm talking about continuing church culture. We will learn it somewhere. Amen? Our culture that is developed, we will learn from somewhere. When we read in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, we can learn so much about Jewish culture. When you read about the Jews and the children of Israel, when you read about how God dealt with them and how God called them, how they started from Abraham's calling and then Isaac and Jacob and then into Egypt and then brought out of Egypt by Moses and then led into the promised land by Joshua and then ruled by the judges and then eventually prophets and then kings and, and so on and so forth, you learn the culture of this nation. You learn what makes them who they are. In fact, you learn so much about their culture, you can find in the culture of the Jewish nation, you can find that they served one God. That made them different from every other culture. Other cultures served multiple gods. They served idols of wood and stone. They served things that appealed to the flesh. But our God, the God of Israel, is not a God that is a God about serving the flesh. In fact, when people say, oh, the Bible is written by man, it was not written by God, I, you read, the, evidently people that say that have never read this book before. Because when you read about a book that was written by a man, about what man wants and what man should do, it's about our flesh. Amen? It's about pleasing me. It's about getting my way, about accomplishing my will. That is not the word of God. It's about a God, a holy God that has called his people out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's called us to deny ourselves and deny our will and deny our flesh and seek after him. And so in the Jewish culture, you find that they worshiped one God and that one God had a plan for them. We don't always understand. We don't always study the way we should to realize why God did certain things, certain ways, but they even had certain diets that God told them about. There were things they should eat and things they shouldn't eat in the Jewish culture. You know, when it came to fish, if it didn't have scales or fins, they, they weren't to eat it. When it came to certain animals, if it didn't chew the cud and have a, a split hoof, they weren't to eat it. When it came to certain clothing, they weren't to mix and match different types of fibers together. Even the priests, when they would go into worship, the Lord said, when you go into worship, wear something linen not cotton, because God said in so many words, I don't want you stinky when you're ministering to people. <laughs> it would cause sweat. It would cause them to become unclean, so they would wear linen, something that would breathe. There were so many different things in their culture. There was a way of worship that God wanted them to worship. There were things that they were to do with sacrifices and offerings. There was a home life that they were to example to their children and pass on to generation to generation. When you read the Shema, the, the word of God, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. They were to do it when they rose up in the morning. They were to do it when they sat down to eat. They were to do it when they were walking down the street. They were to do it before they lay down to bed. They were to quote this and remember it and to study it and to learn it. 
because it was their culture. It was their culture. It was what made them who they were. It's what made them a separated people. It's what made them different. It developed their community life, everything about them. For the Jewish nation, their relationship with God was to, influ- was to be the influence of their culture. It was to influence other nations around them. God told Abraham, through you, through this relationship that I have with you, through your children and your descendants and this promise that I'm giving you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Why? Because they were to see the life of a blessed man and his relationship with his God and the culture that it created in his home and in his life. And it would bless other people. Why? Because they could learn it. They could imitate it. It could change their heart and their life. Amen. We will learn culture from somewhere. We will learn it from somewhere. It was God's word. Everybody say his word. It was his word that was to create their learned behavior, which was to be passed on by imitation, by instruction, and by example. And I believe that the greatest thing we could have, church, is a culture that is birthed through a relationship with Jesus Christ and his word. Can you say amen? I want the attitudes and behavior in my home to develop because they were birthed through Jesus and that relationship with him and that relationship with his word. Because we have culture in our home. What we practice in our home will be imitated by our children. Amen? The words we speak, the attitudes we have, the actions that we do, it will all be imitated. I mentioned last week that we'll never know how successful we were in raising our children uh, until we see our grandchildren. Amen? And that can be challenging. Amen? That can be eye-opening to some of us. But thanks to God for his grace. Thanks to God for his mercy. Thanks to God that it's not over until he says it's over. Can you say amen? Thank to God that we can still pray and fast and seek his will and intercede for somebody and hopefully everything we instilled in them because it's still their choice will draw them back to him one day if they've fallen away. Amen. Psalms 33 and 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. God has chosen us for his inheritance. Think about that for a minute. God said, I want you as my people. I want you as my children. I want you as my church. Everything that Jesus did while he was on this earth was to build his church culture. The behavior was to be passed on by, again, imitation, by instruction, by example. Everything that he did. When he chose his 12 disciples and took them with him, everything that Jesus did. We're going to talk more about that tonight. But it was all to build that culture that he wanted in his church. Amen. His first message to those who would begin to follow him and hear him was the same message his predecessor communicated, and that was to... Repent. John the Baptist came preaching repentance. Jesus also came preaching repentance. Repentance means to consider your ways. Consider your lifestyle. Consider your attitude, your behavior. Does it align with my word? If not, turn so it can align with my word, so it can align with that relationship because I want to build something in your life. I want you to have something, a blessing, a promise, something tangible that is spiritual that you can have in your life and a promise for eternity that you can pass on to your children children and for generations to follow. God's saying, I want you to have that. That's an awesome blessing. For God to say, I want to bless you while you're on this earth, and I want your focus to be on my kingdom, because one day all this is going to be gone, but you're going to be with me in eternity forever, worshiping me and praising me. No more sorrow, no more tears, only joy, only peace, only worshiping God forever. That's a great promise. And that's the culture he wants to be in our home and in our families and passed on from generation to generation. We've been talking about growing the church. It happens through continuing church culture. Amen. So his message was repent. He was creating a culture of holiness because before anything else, God is holy. God is morally pure he is without fault he is light and in him is no darkness at all we've mentioned this before god is holy so all of his other attributes are founded upon his holiness 
Because he's holy and perfect, every other attribute of God, his judgment, his justice, his love, his mercy, his grace, all those are perfect. And so God has called us to be holy, set apart. Everybody say set apart. Set apart. Belonging to him, that's what he wants. He wants a culture of holiness. Hebrews 12 and 14 tells us, follow peace with all men and follow peace with all men and holiness. Come on, say it with me. Holiness. Holiness. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Okay, Hebrews 12, 14. Your scripture to memorize for this week. Amen. Holiness is separation unto God for his will and purpose according to his word. He's called us to be holy. He's not called us to be morally perfect. He's called us to be set apart, something he can use that he is perfecting day by day. Just because we receive the Holy Ghost, just because we get baptized in Jesus' name doesn't mean we never make a mistake again. It doesn't mean we never fail again. It doesn't mean we're perfect, but God is perfecting us is what it means. He's creating in us a life and a lifestyle to please him. The Jews believed that they were holy because they were Jewish. Believe it or not, that mentality is still in some faiths today. Some people believe that they are saved simply because they are part of that religious organization. Not the case. It's all about a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus Christ, amen? So the Jews thought that they were holy because they were Jewish. Their culture was based upon the law of Moses. They called it the law of Moses, but it was really the word of God. Amen. Moses gave it to them, and so their culture was based upon that. Jesus came to show us that the culture of his church was to be based upon the relationship we were to have with the Father. Amen. It doesn't negate the law. It doesn't make the law of none effect. It doesn't mean that it's purposeless or pointless. What it means is that through just obeying certain rules and principles and going through the motions does not create a culture. It creates a habit. And there is a difference. Amen. It's all about our motive and why we're doing it. And so they were doing things for certain reasons. They were doing it because it was part of their law. It was part of their culture. It's what they had always done. Jesus wanted them to understand that the culture of his church was based upon the relationship we were to have with God. It's so much more than just simply following a set of rules. It's about the relationship with that word that we have. Matthew 15 and 7, Jesus called them hypocrites. And he's saying, Esaias or Isaiah prophesied of you saying this. He said, this people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I think Sister Vicki just used that in prayer on Wednesday. Their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Amen. So there was a culture that they had, and Jesus wanted them to understand that this culture was more than just following a set of rules. This culture was about having that relationship with the Father. Amen. Their leaders were more concerned with the following of ordinances. Jesus was more concerned with the motive of their hearts while following said ordinances. Mark 16 and 16, a perfect example. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. What is he saying? He's saying that baptism for the sake of following a command is simply getting wet. Amen. But baptism, because I desire to take on the name of Jesus Christ, baptism because I believe that my sins will be washed away by his blood, baptism believing that I will rise in newness of life and have a motive to love and serve God, that's what Jesus was referring to. Believing and being baptized, understanding the power of the name of Jesus and what that can do in a life that desires to be changed. Doing anything for God's word, uh, anything in God's word just for the sake of following a command is empty. Jesus is looking at our heart. Hebrews 4 and 12 tells us that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it can pierce even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit through the joints and the marrow. And it's also a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. 
Church, when we're born again, when we repent of our sins, when we are baptized in Jesus' name, having those sins remitted, when we are filled with God's presence and God's power, his spirit, we are new creatures in Christ. We are a new individual. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, therefore, if any man be in Christ, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are become new. We're given a new heart. We're given a new life. We're, giving, we're given new behavior, which is to be passed on by that imitation, by instruction and example. We are given the opportunity to be a part of a new culture. Amen. This world's culture, the world that we live in, is very different from church culture. We have to be careful because the world wants to blend the two. Amen? Just like they did uh, back in, uh, after Jesus' death, just like they did uh, after even the death of, of John uh, the Revelator, just like they did when churches began to become more organized and, and they would say in the beginning of church, even back to the Council of Nicaea, if you look in church history, when they began to say, can we worship, you know, we're Greeks and, and, and this is Christ and this is Christianity, but can we worship our Greek way of worshiping our false gods? And they said, oh, sure, you can. Can we call ourselves Christian for the sake of the day? Oh, sure, you can. Can we bring in our idols and, and worship them and just give them different names? Oh, sure, you can. Why? Because they wanted to mix and confuse the culture of the church. God was not about that. God was about separation. It's about his word. It's about his holiness. It's about his presence and his power working in our life. The world's culture is very different. There's a different focus which produces different behavior. There is a focus on self and self-preservation. There's a focus on things, tangible. What can I have? What can I, what can I possess? What can I gain? Jesus said uh, in his parables, in his teaching, he says, what will you do? You'll, you'll plant more fields and you'll say, I can't fit it all in my barn, so I'm going to tear down my barn and I'm going to build a bigger barn so I can fit more in it. He says, you fool, don't you realize that tomorrow your soul is going to be required of you and then who shall these things be? There is a culture in this world. How much can I gain? How much can I pack away? Because one day I might need it. There's nothing wrong with having things. I have things. Things can be needful. Things can be helpful. Things can be fun. Nothing wrong with having things, but I'm talking about the motive. Perfect example in Luke 14 and 16. Jesus taught a parable, and he says, a certain man made a great supper, and he invited many people. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were invited, come, it's all ready. The table is set. The silverware is polished. The cups are full. The plates are overflowing. It smells wonderful in here. Come on in and sit down. It's all ready. It's hot. Ready to eat. And all of them, with one consent, began to make excuse. All the ones that were invited, they knew it was coming. They had received a prior invitation. It wasn't that he made the supper and said, hey, can I find somebody at the last minute to come in and eat this? No, he, he had this. He invited many. It was planned. It was prepared. And so when the time, everybody say the time, the time was come. It's in God's timing. And when the time was come, he said to them, come in, it's all ready. And they began to make excuse on why they couldn't be there on why they couldn't come and eat this supper that they knew was going to take place, that they knew was being prepared just for them. And one said, I bought a piece of ground. I have to go and see it. Could you please have me excused? Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I need to go prove them. I need to make sure I got a good deal. I pray thee, would you have me excused? Another said, I've married a wife and I can't come. Rylan, I'm glad you're here today. He said, I married a wife. I can't make it. We've got to get my household in order. We got plans. We got, we got our honeymoon. We got vacations. We got things. We need to go and visit people. We got to get all these things done. Is there anything, anybody own any land here today? Sure. I'm talking even, the, you know, your house. Or does anybody have any animals or possessions? 
Is anybody married? Are these bad things? No, but the Bible says, Jesus said, just as it will be in the days of, as it was in the days of Noah, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. It's going to be the same way when Jesus returns for his church. There's nothing wrong with these things. They're needful, they're helpful, they're, they're fine, but what he's saying is that that mentality of the world and its culture means that these things are more important than the culture and the relationship, the attitudes, behaviors we have with Jesus Christ. The mentality, the motive, everything about it is very different. When you look at the way our world perceives and thinks and you look at the way that the church is to perceive things and think and believe, it's very, very different. Pe people skip out on God for all kinds of good reasons. I mean, there's, there's some people that, that I haven't seen in quite a while. They must have bought some land or gotten married or bought some oxen. I don't know. But it must be pretty good to keep us out of church for as long as it does. Amen? We can make all kinds of what we call good excuses, but we had better be careful because the farther we're away from the culture that God intends us to have, the closer we're getting to a different culture. That means our attitude is changing. That means our behavior is changing. That means the things that we think and believe in to be true are changing. Their culture defined what took priority in their life. Our culture still defines what takes priority in our life. I've got all these things, so I've got to pay for them, so I've got to work overtime, so I can't be there. I've got this, these plans, I've got vacations, I've got anniversaries, I've got parties to attend, I've got these things to do. I, I've got my lawn to mow. I've heard people missing church because they're mowing lawn. It's going to grow again. We've got to have a real, and, and, and what's important is I understand that it's one day, it's, it's a couple hours out of your week, it's one service, well really it's three, and it's more hours, but there's so much more because it's what we learn, it's what we continue to imitate and emulate and behave as, that's why it's important, it's continuing in that culture, but I understand that just missing one is not going to change me for the right reason, but again I'm talking about motive and, and what one will turn into. It's all about what our culture is, what is already being practiced. Because we can have, in a worldly culture, we can fit church into our worldly culture. But you cannot fit the world into a church culture. Somebody hear me today. You can have your world's culture. You can have all the things that you're important and you can squeeze in a little time for Jesus on a Sunday. You can squeeze in a little something here or a little something there. You can squeeze the, the church into your world's mindset, but you cannot fit the world into Christ's mindset because it is different. Amen. Amen. I wish somebody would get on board today. I wish we'd begin to understand what it really means, what God is really calling us to and who he's calling us to be. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Brother Ryland was so right on last Sunday night when he talked about all that's in the world is the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. These things are not of the Father. They are of the world. But that's a culture. We've got to understand. That's why James said in chapter 4, verse 4, he called them adulterers and adulteresses. Ooh, that's harsh language. Adulterer, adulteress. Adultery, we don't like to hear that word, do we? No, we don't like to, even when it's true, we don't, people that have done that and, and have had, made that mistake or that error in their life or have strayed or whatever has caused it, they don't like to hear that word. We don't like to have it called out for what it is, right? Because it's sin and we don't like to be called out on our sin. But he says, you adulterers and adulterers, don't you know that friendship with the world, he identified friendship with the world as adultery. Why? Because it's division or separation from God. If you're going to be a friend of the world, you're going to be the enemy of God. That's why he called it idolatry. As I mentioned, our world's culture differs from church culture. The world is focused on self. It's about me. It's about what I want. It's about how I look. It's about how I feel. It's about what, what pleases me. 
But Jesus said in Luke 9 and 23, he said to them all, if you desire to come after me, any man, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. Your self-will has to be crucified for whoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? Remember, our culture is defined by our learned attitudes and behaviors. What our young people are learning from our world's culture today, what are they learning? They're learning tolerance. Now, I don't have a problem with tolerance, but I do have a problem with tolerance to sin. Amen? They begin to, under, well, it's just a different lifestyle. It's just, it's their life partner. It doesn't have to, we can redefine what marriage is. We can redefine what, what gender is. We can redefine what really life and, and happiness. We can redefine anything we want to. Because it's our world. We can create a new culture. That's what's happening. It didn't used to be that way in our culture. Oh, it existed. But it was not a learned or imitated or example behavior. It was something that people were not proud of. It was a sin they struggled with like any other sin, but it wasn't an accepted sin. See, that's the difference today. There's sin that's accepted and there's sin that's not accepted. If you're a murderer today, you do it in secret. You try not to get caught. But anything else or other things, you can publish it and say that's okay. Because it's what our culture has changed. It didn't used to be that way. Don't you see? Don't we understand that our culture is changing? Why? Because we don't want to hurt anybody. We don't want to offend anybody. It's not about hurting somebody or offending somebody. It's about seeing people saved. It's not about hate. It's about love. Do you love me enough to confront me when something is wrong in my life? Or do you not love me enough to tell me what I'm doing is wrong? I hope you love me enough to tell me when something's wrong. I love my kids enough to tell them when something's wrong. But don't we hold each other to the same level of accountability when we see something that we know is not a part of God's plan for our life? Why? Because the culture of the world is trying to intermingle in our life and it's trying to influence us to imitate it. Ask yourself that question. What are our young people learning from our world's culture? What are my children learning from this world's culture? What are they learning at school? And is my influence at home strong enough to overpower that? It should be. It can be. Because through Christ, I can do all things. Amen. Our world has believed the lie of the enemy and created a sin culture that's being passed on by imitation, by instruction, and by example. That's why Jesus said in James 4 and 4, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you the enemy of God? We cannot serve two masters. Jesus created a culture on which he built his church. The culture is the attitudes and behaviors that emulate those who have been born again and those who have his word growing and thriving in their hearts. This culture is given to us by instruction of his word, through Bible study, through Sunday services where we come together and hear the word of God preached, through discipleship classes or, or mentoring classes or, or discipling and, and teaching somebody. That's how it's passed on by instruction. We need instruction. Amen. It's to be, that culture is to be exampled to everyone that we can influence with it. It's through our lifestyle, through how we live, through how we speak, through how we act. And it's to be imitated by all who receive it. I need to continue to imitate Jesus Christ. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Can you say amen? amen. Let's stand together today. Jesus began with a culture of holiness based upon a changed heart and a relationship with him. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and I will be your God and you will be my people. You'll be my children. I want to create a culture in our, what he's, we are the family of God. Amen. We're his children. We've been born again into his image, into the church family. There is to be a culture in the church of our home in our life. There is to be something that we imitate and practice and continue in. 
separation from the world. When our kids come home and things are being uh, communicated at, at school, I'm not bashing schools. I'm thankful for teachers. I'm thankful for what kids can learn in school, but I believe there needs to be a, a line where they're learning some things at home that are more important as far as our culture goes. Can you say amen? Our, our schools can teach about history. They can teach about governments. They can teach mathematics and English and foreign language. They can teach uh, different things as far as extracurricular things and sports. I have no problem with that, but our culture has to be defined in our home. What we listen to, what we watch, how we talk, what we do, how we dress, based upon God's word. That's what the Jews did, but not out of obligation to a law but out of relationship with a Savior. Amen. And it's learned. It's to be imitated. It's to be example. It's to be instructed and taught. That's why when somebody comes in brand new and gets born again or gets the Holy Ghost, it's not, all right, here's all the changes you need next week. Show up looking right, acting right, talking right, living right. That's not it. It's a culture. But to continue in it, we have to continue to instruct it. Amen? And sometimes instruction or correction is a little uncomfortable because it deals with our emotions. And we begin to feel a little bit of conviction. Conviction is a good thing. Conviction draws us to repentance. There should be conviction in our life. We should hold certain convictions. Amen? We should have that. I'm not talking about condemnation. I'm not talking about, oh, you're so messed up, you can never be saved. I'm not talking about uh, no hope and no future. I'm talking about a life that says, God, if I've done anything to displease you, if there is something in my life, God, if there's something, Lord, in the way that I'm living that you are unhappy with, and God, I know that there is, then, Lord, I want to change that. And I want to be like you, God. I need your forgiveness. I need your grace, God, to help me to become who you want me to be. There's things I struggle with, God, in your word. It's because I'm flesh and you are holy. But, God, I want to be made in your image and I want to become more like you. So, Jesus, would you help me with that? God, would you be patient with me in that? And he will. Because he loves us and he cares about us. And he wants his church to grow and to thrive. And that's what it's all about. That's how we grow. That's how we learn. That's how we continue. There has to be a continuation of culture. I find it very interesting that as far as I know in our English or American language, there's no past tense version of the word disciple. If I try to type it in my notes that they were discipled of Paul, it doesn't work. It's underlined in red, so it's not a word. Because discipleship doesn't end. I have to continue to be teachable. I have to continually learn. I have to be continually retrained in things. Why? Because the world is trying to influence what's happening in your homes and in my home and in our church and in our communities. The world is trying to influence that. But Jesus has called us to be light in a dark world that can illuminate and people can see and learn. We are the salt and light of the world. We are the prudence, the understanding, the wisdom for others to follow. Not going to hide it under a bushel. Not going to go to my job or my school or my community and say, oh, no, no, I, no, no, it's nothing. It's just me. I'm just different like that. It's a personal conviction. No, it's about my relationship with God. It's about what the Word of God says, and I love Him, and I want that to be in my home and in my family, and I want my community, I want my world to see it. Why? Because I want to influence somebody to love Jesus Christ. Culture is going to happen. If we don't follow what Jesus began, we will follow something. It's going to happen. There's no stopping it. It's everywhere. And it's up to those who are learning and exampling and imitating it to continue it. And do you know where it begins? It begins in our home. It begins around your dinner table. It begins with conversation with your family and your loved ones. It, can, it, it continues as we learn, as we example what God has shown us in our lives. 
It's our attitude and our behavior based upon what we believe to be true. And that's Jesus Christ and his word. I don't know about you, church, but I want to continue church culture in my home. I want to continue. I want to see it continued in the church. I want to see it continued in our communities and in our families and in our schools and in our jobs. I want people to ask, what is so different about you? What makes you different? It's okay to be different. It's okay to want to be like Jesus. It's okay to not want to follow the, the, the paradigms that society has set for us. It says, if you don't fall into this, you don't fit. I want to continue in the church. If that's your desire or wherever you're at today, I invite you to come. Take some time with Jesus today and say, Lord, ask yourself the hard question. Ask Jesus, God, am I living the way you want me to live? Is it in my home, God, the way it needs to be? And whatever's not right, Lord, would you help me to change it? Would you help me, God, to create, Lord God, through your word and through the relationship I have with you, God, that culture that you desire in your church to be in my home, where, God, this is a priority. God, this is more important than anything else. My kids have things to learn, but they will learn nothing greater in their life than how to love Jesus. And the only place they're truly going to get it, God, is from me and my home and my family. It's my responsibility to keep my light burning, to keep it shining. Maybe your culture has been changed. Maybe there's some things that have taken place in your life beyond your control. Maybe it wasn't your choice, but can I encourage you that God is wanting to empower you. He wants to empower you to be redefined in His image. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, Lord, make me more like you, God. Come on, church, this altar is open. There's no better place than to start than at an altar of repentance. That's where Jesus began. That's where we need to begin every time. That's where we need to find ourselves every day. Is at that altar that says, God, I need to change. Make me more like you, Jesus. Hallelujah.